Hey, Cypher here, and I'm trying to get this one out quickly. So, sorry for the video quality, I'm doing this on a webcam. Anyways, while I'm producing this, there are mass protests happening throughout the United States, all of which are related to the killing of George Floyd. Though there were a few incidents that fed everyone's anger into this, such as some former sheriff deputies shooting Ahmad Aubrey, all of which appear to be racially motivated. The protests in turn have spiraled into violence with rioting, looting, and arson. Even in the town that I'm in, Albuquerque, protesters have resorted to violence. In response, the president has called for police brutality on Twitter, publicly. And this is something I've never seen before. And thereby, he's stoking the flames of public discord to levels worse than that of 2014 during the Ferguson riots. And while I was editing this, the US is teetering on the edge of using the Insurrection Act specifically to suppress what Trump calls a terrorist organization. Unlike how people are portraying this, that's actually been used to great effect in the past, specifically such as 1992 and 1968, which we'll talk about, though it's never had this tinge of terrorism nonsense. Trump even ordered police to disperse a peaceful protest. As we speak, I am dispatching thousands and thousands of heavily armed soldiers, military personnel, and law enforcement officers. He was trying to clear a park for some reason. And as Legal Eagle said, It was the stuff of tin pot dictators in banana republics. Though we've definitely had this on American soil before. Basically, the police became the rioters in this case. Now, I've seen a bunch of people using this Martin Luther King quote to excuse the riots. I think we've got to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. But he was pretty clear in saying that we must understand why the riots happen while also refusing to condone them. As he said in that very same interview, I would hope that we can avoid riots because riots are self-defeating and socially destructive. History bears him out on that, actually. This is a crazy time, so don't lose yourself in it. King Richard I demands that everybody be kind to each other. Anyways, yet again, 2020 is continuing to usurp my expectations. For instance, I'm going to need to update that 1920 comparison video eventually, because the coronavirus death toll is more than 300,000 worldwide, and with everyone out in the streets, we're bound for a second wave in the United States. But the current situation requires a different analytical lens than simply comparing 1920 to 2020, even though I do intend to update that video. So I think it's time to look at previous instances of mass racial violence to gain some perspective. Because this is by no means new or even that different. And if history is good for anything, it's forewarning us. This kind of unrest fills the pages of US history, and I can never hope to explore its entirety. So I'm only looking at one racist plight here, specifically black and white race riots. But I think we can learn from looking at the long view and seeing this craziness is part of a larger trend. Richard Maxwell Brown, the preeminent historian on American violence, stated in his magnum opus, Since the establishment of slavery in the colonial period, three major phases of black-white violence stand out. 1. An initial phase of sporadic black revolts and plots for revolt during the long period of slavery. 2. A middle, long-term era of mainly white-initiated violence, riots and lynchings especially, carried out to maintain post-slavery white supremacy in America. And three, the recent 1960s cycle of massive ghetto ugh, riots in reacting to the deprivations suffered by blacks in the United States. Due to the dated language, you can probably tell that was written in 1975. But interestingly enough, I think the final phase still stands. So let's look at a few exemplary cases that shows this trend. First off, we've got slave revolts. The overarching cause of these is pretty obvious enslavement. There were several conspiracies and even a few major revolts in the United States. Now since I've already done a video on one of these, I'll link to that real quick and let's talk about an even earlier one. 
The 1811 German Coast Uprising was the largest slave revolt in U.S. history, at least if you don't include the Seminole Wars. When the U.S. bought Louisiana, a flurry of newspapers began publication in New Orleans. Events in Haiti alit fears among the planter class as they read of gruesome massacres there. The sole successful slave rebellion in history created that state, and vengeance for enslavement drove them to commit genocide upon their former oppressors. After years of white fear-mongering about this revolution spreading to America, a slave named Charles Deslande plotted to overthrow the slaveocracy. He gathered perhaps as many as 500 slaves to his conspiracy and struck out, killing a few owners in their wake. Immediately, the powers that be in the area brutally quelled the rebellion, and the fear instilled by this rebellion fueled southern retrenchment in what they called their peculiar institution. Thus was the story of American slave rebellions. They served to strengthen the fears of slave owners and bolster their willingness to resort to cruelty. The only successful revolts were shipboard, and those could never challenge the system they bore in their hulls. It took the Civil War to end slavery in the United States, but that didn't result in equality. White supremacy was popular amongst the North as well as the South, and radical Republicans trying to create equality was in no way successful. Throughout the Reconstruction period, civilians took matters into their own hands to enforce racial inequality, and another incident in New Orleans sparked it all again. Several southern jurisdictions passed black codes designed to virtually re-enslave freedmen through conniving and bigoted laws. The Republicans in New Orleans despised this and organized a protest and convention to make a new Louisiana constitution. Counter-protesters set upon them with a fury unprepared for by the protesters. A massacre ensued, killing 48, most of whom were black Union veterans. Only a couple months prior, another so-called riot in Memphis, Tennessee killed 46, sending black residents fleeing from the city for safety. But unlike slave revolts, these riots hindered the white supremacists. For these riots were pivotal ammunition used against the more lenient President Johnson to institute a reconstruction based on equality. The federal government worked to institute civil rights in a way it had never done before. Unfortunately, that just drove white supremacist violence underground, until the federal government capitulated and withdrew a decade later, making way for Jim Crow laws to usurp the U.S. Constitution and establish complete racial segregation in the later decades. With Jim Crow, a new wave of race riots began. Oftentimes, these began with some sort of crossing racial boundaries. Whites would take matters outside of the law, choosing to instead publicly shame, beat, and worst of all, lynch whomever they considered inferior and worthy of such punishment. In 1915, the Ku Klux Klan arose again, and they became the focal point for white supremacist terrorism. Many returning black soldiers from World War I believed in an idea called the New Negro, which inspired militant self-determination for black communities. So those communities attempted to protect themselves from this onslaught of violence. And that dynamic set the stage for 1919's Red Summer, which is when numerous riots began with black communities trying to prevent violence, but unfortunately often unsuccessfully. The first of these happened in Jenkins County, Georgia, where an arrest turned ugly, with a white policeman bashing a resistant black man over the head during a prohibition check. His son, Joe Ruffin, shot the officer and his partner in retaliation. Fearful of a lynching, the black community fortified themselves while white mobs attacked. In the process, four died from the fighting. Ruffin eventually surrendered himself to the police, serving only four years in prison. And there are innumerable riots beyond that, plus the 83 recorded lynchings that year, 76 of which were black people. But that's not including things like what happened in Elaine, Arkansas, where whites massacred well over a hundred blacks after a shootout with arresting officers. Chicago exemplified Red Summer. The long segregated city experienced an influx of black population as people moved from the South during the Great Migration. 
and so tensions between white and black residents mounted. A white man trying to shoo black kids from the white side of the beach threw rocks at them, killing one. Instead of the police arresting the man for manslaughter, or even possibly murder, the majority white police force instead arrested one of the protesters who was simply calling for justice. That protester was a black man, and so this caused black residents to protest even more. But then Irish gangs attacked the protests, spiraling them into riots. For a week, Chicago lost all control. People sniped at each other on rooftops, white kids symbolically continued to pummel any black kids they could find with rocks, and black housing had numerous fire bombings, leaving around a thousand people homeless. Only the National Guard coming in to patrol the streets for a few days ended the violence, which took 38 lives. Overall, Red Summer killed thousands. While there were still constant lynchings, race riots, and massacres throughout the interwar period, nothing changed. These riots weren't as clear-cut as during Reconstruction, though. With hindsight, we can see that whites were definitely the primary aggressors, but at the time, white newspapers were blind to the difference between aggression and defense. So the Klan continued to exist while the New Negro Movement was vilified as causing Red Summer. Instead, organizations came to promote civil rights, with the NAACP taking center stage through legal counsel, lobbying, and newspaper campaigns. Nonviolence principles made significant headway throughout the post-war period, eventually resulting in the Civil Rights Movement's crowning achievement, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. They did so by marching from Selma while the police brutally attacked the clearly peaceful protest, which I spoke about in this episode. By not resorting to violence in return, they strengthened the appeal of passing the Voting Rights Act. That's civil disobedience in action. In Selma, there is a lesson to be learned. And it's extremely effective in getting politicians to do something about the situation. But another substantial shift came that year. In Los Angeles, the arrest of Marquette Fry, I hope I'm saying that right, for reckless driving caused a minor scuffle with the police. But newspapers reported far worse, including the police supposedly beating a pregnant woman who was never even there. Idiotic reporting led to outrage, and the protests turned into a riot. The entire Watts area erupted in violence, with police unable to contain the unrest. Not until the National Guard came to patrol was the riot quelled, with 34 total dead. A couple years later was the long hot summer, when 159 riots flared up across the United States, most related to protesting police brutality. These killed more than 80 people nationwide. And Detroit was the worst of these, which I've actually already done an episode on that as well. So let's move on to the following summer with another round of mass unrest. When a sniper killed Martin Luther King in 1968, riots yet again swept the nation. These killed more than 40 people. The nation's capital, Washington DC, basically became lawless, killing 13 people in the carnage. Not until the army came in four days later was law restored. Throughout the country, arson, looting, and disorganized violence swept the streets. And here, the aggressors were clear. It was the angry mob this time, and Congress would make them pay for their misdeeds. An additional part of that year's Civil Rights Act was added, called the Civil Obedience Act. And yes, it gave the federal government power to charge people with inciting or participating in a riot. The overall civil rights bill was meant to solve housing segregation, but instead became an instrument for suppression. Police learned from the 1960s, and so have started taking less and less harsh measures to crack down on riots. Using protective padding and shields to allow them to push a crowd in a particular direction, while using pepper spray and non-noxious tear gas to disperse violent crowds. For the most part, this has kept violence from becoming deadly. When protests turn to riots, typically the only consequences are a few scrapes and bruises, so long as the riot is easily dispersed. That's not what happened in 1992, the most violent riot since the 1960s. Beforehand, police had publicly beat a teenager named Rodney King, and those officers never spent time for it. 
Just before that, a Korean store owner shot a 15-year-old girl named Latasha Harlins in the back of the head. It followed a minor scuffle over a supposedly stolen drink, and Harlins was leaving. That store owner only received five years in prison despite the jury recommending a maximum sentence. The mayor of LA denounced the Rodney King verdict and pleaded for tranquility, but angry protests broke out, quickly resorting to rioting. The violence was aided by inner gang warfare, and Koreans especially were targeted. Chaos reigned for five days before the National Guard finally mobilized enough people to aid police in quelling the disturbance, which had taken 63 lives total. The violence was so stark that the presidential candidates that year unified to denounce what they called a culture of poverty, which supposedly caused black LA citizens to lash out without enough welfare. Yeah, both Clinton and Bush used this supposed culture of poverty to promote their hard-on-crime stance while further militarizing the police, which is a huge problem. And finally, we get to Ferguson, which was the result of sensational reporting of a police-related shooting. It's recent enough, I don't need to go into too much detail, but the favorite catchphrase, hands up, don't shoot, is adopted from bad reporting on the incident, though it has contradictory witness testimony and physical evidence that supports the cop's story. No evidence supports the frequently reported story of the victim saying, don't shoot. But of course, whether or not the inciting incident has particular nuances, the fact is, police have a long record of racial profiling, disproportionate arrests, and basically picking on the black population of the United States. So the protests are what started the Black Lives Matter movement. And might I point out, for those who like to say all lives matter, in order for all lives to matter, black lives must matter. Unfortunately, the protests turned to riots in 2014, but these were mostly people just throwing stuff at the police rather than escalating into full-blown chaos. So, what can this long history teach us about the current race riots? Well, first and foremost, ends never justify the means, no matter how noble the goal. In fact, riots often defeat the goals of the protests they're spawned from. Resorting to violence increases rhetoric against it which is ultimately used to suppress protests. White supremacists in the late 19th century managed to keep their goals by avoiding direct confrontation with the system. The success of the civil rights movement came from non-violence, using police brutality to illustrate the system's illegitimacy. 1965 through 68's riots simply led to the government usurping civil rights legislation so that they could suppress protests. We can understand why these riots are taking place while simultaneously refusing to engage in them. Ends do not justify the means. If you don't want police brutality, do not give them the propaganda win that will allow them to fund even more militarization. The police are not the National Guard. The military is the military, so keep it that way. Call in the National Guard when riots become uncontrollable. In all of these cases, the National Guard has been the pacifying force that kept riots from going too far. As soon as there's more guardsmen than police, the scales tip back toward nonviolence. Finally, there is one other conclusion. Never condone violence. Peaceful protesters should ostracize anyone who participates in such misdeeds. Separate rioters from protesters. Keep them from ruining the movement. History shows riots always hinder movements they spawn from. As Friedrich Nietzsche said, anyone who fights monsters should take care that they don't in the process become monsters. And if you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss gazes back into you.